Hey folks, Dr. Alan Davis here. For quite some time I have been discussing the idea, alluding to the fact that I would be doing a video presentation on the seal of God, and that's what I'm going to be doing in this particular video. Now, Seventh-day Adventists have long held to the idea, in peculiarity, that the seal of God is something that is received for a work that is done. In other words, it ties in perfectly with their idea of the investigative judgment, such that once an individual reaches a particular level of cleanliness and character perfection, he or she is then sealed and ready to stand before a holy God without a mediator. But does the Bible teach this? Please stay tuned for the rest of this story. Seventh-day Adventists teach the seal of God is the Sabbath, that is, the seventh day of the week, in terms of keeping it, the day you rest, the day one goes to church. But is this what the Bible teaches? Let's take a careful look, beginning in a Strong's Concordance, to see what it is the SDAs actually teach. Now, before we get to Strong's, there is a belief, because the word sign is used in particular Exodus, in Exodus 31, 13, and 17, as well as some other passages in the Scripture, and involves the Sabbath, that it is the definitive proof to be the seal of God. Now, what does Strong's have to say? Strong says the Hebrew definition is a sign or a signal, perhaps a distinguishing mark, a banner, Remembrance. Now, that somewhat ties in with Sabbath, I would agree there. A miraculous sign, an omen, a warning, and a few other words here and there. In using this term, Adventists have convinced themselves and many others, through creative semantics and literary gymnastics, that the terms sign and seal are the same word. However, without much effort, when we examine these two Hebrew words, sign and seal, we get two distinctly different terms. Oath, which is a sign, and Chotham, which is a seal, and indeed the type one might understand within the context Seventh-day Adventists want you to believe. Ah, but then they refute such an idea by stating, no, 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 we mean a distinguishing mark, you know, one that isn't necessarily visible. You know, the mark Cain received when God cursed him. Of course, oath is the word used when describing how God cursed Cain. No argument. But the mark Cain received and the seal God's people receive are two different ideas altogether. Although both terms can be figurative, that is, oath and chotham, oath is a noun pertaining to a distinguishing mark, an omen, a warning, remembrance, and so forth, whereas chotham, though a noun, has a verb form, chatham, that literally, and perhaps figuratively, pertains to finishing something and making it complete. You can search the scripture from stem to stern, Genesis to Revelation, nowhere will you find the Sabbath as a day or commandment doing this. Rather, the Sabbath is continuously portrayed as a physical concept, resting from one's physical labor and toil, that teaches a spiritual lesson, to rest from one's own attempts at saving oneself and leaving that work to God and God alone. Its ultimate fulfillment is the life ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What the Bible does teach about the seal of God is this. The believer is sealed by God through his Spirit immediately upon conversion. It is not some future event. Let's take a look at Ephesians 1, verses 12 through 14. That we should be to the praise of God's glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Notice the progression. Number one, praising God's glory. Number two, trusting in Christ. Number three, hearing the word of truth. Number four, receiving salvation as a gift. And number five, sealed by that spirit of truth upon acceptance and belief. And so the seal of God is, in effect, the spirit coming into one's life through conversion and the born-again experience. Done. That's all it is. 
This is the simple piece of it all. Now, let's examine this idea just a little more carefully. In Revelation 14, we read about the 140 and 4,000 who have the seal of God in their foreheads. Earlier in chapter 7, they received this seal. Notice the language. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Many of us are familiar with that passage. Now, let's take a look at Revelation 7, verses 2 and 3. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Without much exegesis, we can see the name of God and the seal in the forehead are the same. But what I want to examine is this matter just a little bit more carefully. Of note, other Greek texts state the 144,000 have both the sons and the father's names written in their foreheads. And I think that's pretty interesting. And frankly, I'm in agreement with this idea because Christ is the only way to God, and without his name, we don't receive the name of God, the Almighty God, Jehovah. So now what I want to do, friends, is I want to go to Deuteronomy 6. Follow me there, if you would. I would imagine all of us are familiar with this passage. This is known as the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words, pay attention here, friends, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Please notice how the declaration of who God is, is to be in the heart, that is the mind, the entire being of, of the human, between the eyes, in the forehead, and upon the hand, an agreement and a commitment to service. In effect, friends, this is a covenant. I'll get into more detail in a later presentation, but the idea of one, echad, denotes just that, one. There is no need for semantics, creative gymnastics, trying to make it mean anything that it does not mean. It does not mean anything other than the idea that there is only one God. Said another way, Moses here is reinforcing monotheism, unlike the polytheism of the Egyptians and the nations of Canaan. In fact, the first commandment of the Decalogue, which, by the way, literally means ten statements or words, not actually commandments, is telling us the very same thing. Let's take a look at Deuteronomy 5, 6. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. The account in Exodus says essentially the same thing, just a little bit differently at the end, instead of from the house of bondage, out of the house of bondage. But in effect, this is a recapitulation of what took place in Exodus 20. Notice the words, I, not we, God, not gods, monotheism. The Shema of Deuteronomy 6 reinforces the Decalogue Israel received 40 years prior to this sermon, which is Deuteronomy. In fact, now follow me here. The original ten statements were given 50 days after the Passover where Israel left Egypt. 50 days. The giving of the law was in keeping with the Feast of Weeks, or what would become the Feast of Weeks, also known as Pentecost. What happened on the antitypical day of Pentecost? It was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, such that the believers were sealed in keeping with what Paul wrote to the Ephesians that we read earlier. So let's put together the pieces. The Spirit of God is the seal. The law was originally given on Pentecost, that is, 50 days after the Passover, when Israel left Egypt. Moses emphasized the sealing of the Spirit, as depicted in Revelation 7 and 14, as an understanding of the law, that is, bound on the hand and frontless between the eyes, whereby the character of God in Christ transforms the believer, and moreover, the Lord our God is one. Echad. So what is the seal of God? It's exactly what Jesus told us it is. You must be born again. What is the seal of God? It's exactly what Paul told us it is. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, 
but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is the seal of God? It's exactly what James told us it is. Pure religion and undefiled before God and our Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affli affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, for those who might still argue the Sabbath issue, I might be able to agree, uh, to agree with you in one way, and only one way. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the day. Rather, it has everything to do with what God has done for us in Christ. Please consider the following. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live in faith, the faith which is in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not make void the grace of God, for if righteousness is through the law, then Christ died for naught. In other words, he died in vain. Paul later wrote in his letter to the Hebrews, There remaineth therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, that is God's rest in Christ, hath himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore give diligence to enter into that rest, that no man fall after the same example of disobedience. Now this is an interesting passage, and I want to spend just a moment looking at it. Now, Adventists typically take this passage as a proof text for Sabbath-keeping under the New Covenant. And they've lost the mark here. Yes, it mentions the seventh day. But the whole context is about entering into God's finished work. And Paul describes a finished work as the work of creation, when God rested. But then Paul takes it to the next level and then describes and enunciates the finished work, which was the work that he did in Jesus Christ. And so when Seventh-day Adventists wish to prove the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath, there's no argument with that. But what they've missed is this passage here is about resting completely and totally in the finished, notice the finished and not ongoing work of Jesus Christ. And that is where they do err in their theology when it comes to their understanding of the Sabbath and how they are to approach it. Finally, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Did you see that? See, Adventists often take that passage in Revelation 14, 12 to cap, as the capstone of the third angel's message to demonstrate that it's about commandment keeping and the faith. Typically, they'll tell you the faith in Jesus, but it really means the faith of Jesus, that is, Jesus' faith. But so often they omit that 13th, voice, that 13th verse. Let's look at it again. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works to follow them. How can the dead die in the Lord? Well, clearly, it means those who are lost have given themselves over to the Lord. They have allowed the flesh to be crucified. And yet, they are now alive. And they, through this new life, are resting entirely in Jesus, who finished the work as the, the propitiation for sin. And in so doing, these folk are now resting from their own labors, their own efforts to save themselves. No investigative judgment. No sealing by keeping the seventh day of the week. Now, please don't misunderstand me. If you find it important to observe and honor the seventh day of the week, to remind you of what God has done for you in Christ, then by all means do so. I do. But I cannot stand in judgment any longer over anybody who chooses to accept that blessing of Christ and yet perhaps not understand it the way that I do. And that's okay. I leave that between them and between God. Friends, if you understand that your life is hidden in Christ because the old man is dead, 
and the life you now live is one completely resting in the finished work of God in Christ, then I will tell you, you have been sealed by the Spirit of God and you have rightly understood the Sabbath teaching. But to think that the Sabbath is the seal of God because of the seventh day of the week, friend, you are in error. I want you to go back to your Bibles. I want you to study it without looking through the lens of Ellen White. You will not come to the conclusion that the Sabbath is the seal of God such that you are keeping the seventh day of the week. If you're honest with yourself, you will find in no uncertain terms that the Sabbath is completely about resting in Christ. And when we do so, we are then baptized by the Holy Ghost and we are then sealed by God now, not in some future event at some close of probation. That's what I want you to take away from this. Is there a lot more to say about it? Absolutely. But I think you have everything that you need now to go forth, do your own study, and come to a complete understanding of what it means to rest in Christ and to receive God's blessing in your life. May the grace of Almighty God and His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, be with you always.